We're going to continue our biblical discourse. This is still continuing in the book of Genesis. We're going to cover from Abraham into the birth of Isaac. The southernmost portion of ancient Sumer was called Chaldea, and the most important Sumerian city was located on the western portion of the Euphrates River, and it was called Ur. The land of Chaldea contained riches beyond imagination, and Ur was the wealthiest city. The history in this region exceeds that of the land of Egypt and its pyramids. There has been much understood about daily living in ancient Mesopotamia. The great ziggurat of ancient Ur was built by King Ernamu, who ruled the area of ancient Ur around 2100 BC. Now this would have been approximately 250 years after the great deluge of Noah, according to Usher's chronology. Archaeologists estimate that there were approximately 24,000 people living in the city of Ur during the time of Abraham. The people of ancient Mesopotamia worshipped many gods. The people of Ur worshipped their chief god named Nana, the moon god. The people of Ur lived in one of two main areas in the city, a very religious sacred place or the common district. The people of ancient Ur were a highly advanced culture. The common district was filled with marketplaces, schools, libraries, and many of the people were very wealthy. People had very nice homes with lush gardens and many conveniences. The very religious sacred place was in an extremely strategic location of the city, protected by strong walls. The place was dedicated to the worship of the moon god Nana. It was in this area that the ziggurat was located. There were also other great temples made of stone. Babel was not the only ziggurat, it's just the most famous one. Many civilizations emulated it. In Ur, there was also a sacred area where people brought their gifts and offerings to the Nana, the moon god. They would also bring their contributions and pay their taxes in this place because Nana was believed to be their protector. There have been excavations in this area with recordings on stone tablets of people's gifts and taxes. These tablets were kept in the temples within the sacred place. This is where we find Abram when we first meet him, but he doesn't stay long. After the death of Abram's brother Haran, his father Terah, still the patriarch of the family, moved his immediate family from Ur. Terah's other son Nehor isn't mentioned as going, so probably he was now the patriarch of his own family. Terah obviously named the land they moved to after Haran, where they dwelt until Terah's death at the age of 205. Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now God told Abram to leave three things behind. First, is Mayarsike, translated here as country. But also it means land. For Terah to name the land Haran, it had to be recognized as belonging to him. With Terah's passing, the land would belong to Abram. But now God was telling him to leave it. He wasn't told to sell it, but rather to abandon it, to give up his rights to it. Next, he was told to leave his Mimal Latike, translated as kindred, but includes his lineage, to put his family's heritage behind. This would indicate that he was now the founding patriarch of what was to follow of his offspring. The tracing back of family roots would always end with Abram. Lastly, he was told to leave behind his Mabi Abike, the house of his father, relatives he had not begotten. However, at this point, Lot was considered part of Abram's house until he became his own house, or I'm sure God would have pointed this out to Abram. Continuing at verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. The souls they had gotten in Haran would be considered part of Abram's house as well. 
had Lot been his own house at the time, saying that if he had stayed behind, neither the Ammonites or the Moabites, as we know of them, would have existed in the way that they did, because the circumstances leading to Lot's descendants would have been very different. How different? We'll never know. Much is said of Abram's age, but Terah lived to be over 200, 205 years old, in fact. So Abram hadn't even entered his middle age yet. Man's age was fast dwindling, but 75 years wasn't a retirement age as it is in these days. Continuing of verse 10, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land, and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Egypt has on many occasions been identified with the secular world. And when a famine hit hard in Moreh, where Abram was dwelling, the original Hebrew in his house went to Mizraim, that is, to Egypt. Sarai, now in her 70s, was still fair to look at, probably like a 30-year-old can be nowadays. And here, Abram seems to have either forgotten of God's promise to him or doubted it. I won't pretend to know which. He told Sarai, who was his sister on his father's side, to tell the Egyptians that this was their only relationship. He feared the Egyptians would want Sarai and would be willing to kill him if they knew they were married. This was not a well-thought-out plan. If they thought he was just her brother, and one of Pharaoh's house did marry her, what was to be the next part of the plan? Is that when they would fall back on what many of us considered to be plan B? Prayer? The conversation would have been an interesting one to be a fly on the wall for. Abram later proves himself to be a wonderful intercessor, but this would have been hard to talk himself out of. And how would Sarai keep herself from being compromised? This was, all in all, a lose-lose situation. Continuing at verse 14, And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen, and he asses and men servants and maid servants, and she asses and camels. Interestingly, we see the plans actually start out great. Sarai was living well in Pharaoh's house, and because of her, Abraham was greatly increasing his wealth. Their trade off is that Lot was very influenced by the worldly part of Egypt. And this would forever alter his life because of the choices he made. It was sometime here with his possessions that Lot became his own house. Again, the story would be different if he had left at this point. That was soon coming. For right now, time simply passed. Continuing at verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her, and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife, and all that he had. The word here translated as plague is nagah, which means to strike grasp violently, or to draw nigh. But he was plagued with gadol negah, or mighty wounds or sores. Whatever means Pharaoh used to get to the bottom of this, he succeeded. This Pharaoh appears to be an honorable man based on his reaction of learning that Sarai was Abram's wife. He could have executed him for lying to the Pharaoh, but instead he returns her to him, and then banishes him, but not necessarily forever, possibly so. Abram got Sarai out of Egypt. He got Lot out of Egypt. What he did not accomplish was getting Egypt out of Lot. Genesis chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him, into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And Lot also, which went up with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. 
for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. Now Lot could now easily be considered his own house. He was rich in cattle and in tents, tents from the Hebrew word ocho, meaning homes or dwelling places. God had promised to bless those who blessed Abram, and this included Lot. But now it was time for the two to separate, and God had devised a way that wouldn't be a bane to either of these two. They agreed to the separation because the land could not support both of them. Abram told Lot to pick a place, and he would go the opposite way. And Lot chose the plains of Jordan, the land toward Sodom, which was well-watered land. We will soon see that Lot isn't living pitching his tent toward Sodom, but pitching it in Sodom. Moving to Genesis chapter 14, beginning at verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Here we see, leading up to this, many citizens of Sodom were taken captive by Kedalaramur, and Lot is among them, telling us that by this time Lot was indeed inside the gates of Sodom. Then we see Abram rescues him once he is made aware of the capture. At this point, we're introduced to someone very special, a unique position until the Messiah came. He is, like Christ, both king and priest. Now, there are some false religions who claim to have a Melchizedekian order, but this is a lie. Because no human who claims to be in that order qualifies for that order. King and priest. Abram confirmed Melchizedek's priesthood by paying tithes to him, meaning all of Israel, and most specifically, all of the Aaronic order of priests paid tithes as well. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 in the book of Hebrews tells why Melchizedek was a superior priest to the Levitical ones. Looking at chapter 15, beginning at verse 5, and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. This is God speaking. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now many would like to know if the plan of salvation changed between the Testaments. When someone asks how anyone in the Old Testament was saved if they did not have a fully revealed plan of salvation, the answer is the same then as it is now. Faith. Salvation has always been by faith. They believed God had a plan to save them and he would carry it out. And he did. They believed God. That is very different from believing in the existence of God because even the demons believe in that. Today, we believe God had a plan that it was carried out, which he did. This is also proof that confession, Eucharist, extreme unction, and any of the like is not a requirement for heaven. As there was no law at the time, keeping the law to get into heaven would have been impossible. Abram believed God. That's all it took. That's all it takes now. When Jesus says, come unto me, believe him. When you believe him, you obey him. Skipping to Genesis chapter 17. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. Skipping to verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. At the age of 99, God changed Abram's name. Abram means father of lofty status. By adding the letter He to his name as a fourth letter, his name was changed to Abraham, or father of many nations. God also changed Sarai, or princess, to Sarah, or queen. By this time, Abraham had fathered Ishmael. I'll admit that as a lad, this confused me. I thought that he had to divorce Sarai, as she was named then, to marry Hagar for them to have a child together. Divorce her and remarry Sarai before they could have children together. Polygamy was a foreign concept to a seven-year-old, and back then, I thought a concubine was something similar to a maze. Later, I learned the correct word for that was catacomb. Sarah's new name was an indication from God himself who the matriarch would be, 
and it certainly was not Hagar. Ishmael was Abraham's genuine son whom he loved greatly. He just was not the son of promise. Moving to Genesis chapter 18, beginning of verse 10, and he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of a woman. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Did Jesus ever appear to anyone in the Old Testament? Yes, he did, on multiple occasions. Here we see the one hardest to deny by naysayers, because Jesus is referred to as the Lord. He arrived with two angels, we later learn, and these he sent to Sodom. When God made his announcement, Sarah didn't laugh out loud, as some say she did. She laughed within herself at the plausibility of what she had heard, and God knew this, and asked Abraham about it, so Sarah would know that God knew. She denied laughing out loud because that's what she thought God was talking about. But God told her she had laughed because he knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When God spoke to Abraham about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham tried to talk him out of it. He wasn't bargaining with God. He was interceding for the righteous. By the time Abraham was finished, we find that there were not even ten righteous people within the city. And there came two angels to Sodom and even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. When we catch up with Lot, we see that he is not just living in Sodom, but he has a position of some authority, perhaps an official, because we see him sitting at the gate of Sodom. Here, he meets the men. He greets them. He appears to have at least a little understanding whom they might be, because I'm pretty sure he doesn't always invite total strangers into his own house. Lot was indeed very aware of the sin of Sodom. Because when they spoke their intention to sleep in the streets, Lot insisted they stay with him. This was a test of Lot's character, and he passed. As angels, they could have easily defended themselves. But this gave Lot a chance to describe aloud what the sin of Sodom was, to bring what he had readily accepted as the new norm to the forefront of his cognitive thoughts and reasoning. Now, there are those who like to beat around the bush about what the sin of Sodom was, because today many are trying again to make it the new norm. Homosexuality was a sin then. We see God punishing it then, and it is a sin now. Only the foolish think it won't be judged now. Just because it hasn't happened yet does not mean that it won't. If there are those who think the sin of the city was something else, read a little further. Beginning of verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house about, with both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto them Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known men. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your own eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. There was a massive outpour, not of people, but of men at Lot's house. These sexual predators somehow knew of these new visitors. They wanted Lot to let them outside, not for a game of twenty questions or to act as tourist guides but to lay with them, the exact thing that Lot was protecting them from. Lot actually offered his virgin daughters to them, not something I would ever recommend. And I think the only reason he did this, besides desperation, was that he knew they had no interest at all in them. Of course, that still doesn't make any sense, and the offer was still dangerous, disgusting, stupid, and disrespectful.
Remember that in a city this size, there weren't even ten righteous. Lot himself had lived there so long that his sons-in-law did not believe him concerning the impending judgment. The angel sent Lot, his wife, and their two daughters out as the Lord rained fire from heaven, destroying Sodom, Gomorrah, and all of Lot's possessions, including all but two of his children. They had been told not to look back, but when Lot's wife thought back on all that she had lost, she did, and she became a pillar of salt. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare unto him, Isaac. Turning back to Abraham and Sarah, we see that God is the original promise keeper. Despite the odds that Vegas might have placed on this, it was a sure thing, because God had said it would happen. Abraham named him Isaac, or more specifically, Yitzhak meaning mirth or laughter. He fit this description because Sarah had to be beside herself for finally providing the heir that God had promised. Abraham still had Ishmael, whom he greatly loved, but this was the son of promise. This was the one in whom all of the world would be blessed. Despite Abraham's love for Ishmael, how different would everything be if he had never taken Hagar and later, after Sarah's passing, Keturah, as his concubines. Since that much discontent has been done against the children of Sarah through the children of Hagar, Lot, and Keturah, Abraham would have been the father of nations through Isaac, because Jacob became Israel, and Esau's current descendants are called Romans. In our next lesson, we'll continue with the lives of Isaac and his children.